Well, welcome back to the Reading and Writing Podcast. My guest today is Chris Panettiere, author of the new novel, Stringers. His previous novel, The Phlebotomist, was on the recommended reading list for the Bram Stoker Award 2020. Chris, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me, Jeff. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. If someone listening hasn't yet heard about your new novel, Stringers, how would you describe the novel? Stringers is a uh, humorous science fiction space opera uh, abduction story <laughs> <laughs> that goes that goes to a lot of places um, I didn't necessarily expect it to go. And do you remember the original idea or impetus that led you to write Stringers? I do. Um, so <laughs> I I was so I'm a trial lawyer by day and I was in a lawsuit. I was in trial and I was listening to a expert witness who I'd heard give testimony a, a million times and I was kind of zoning out. And I thought to myself, I was just daydreaming about animals because that's kind of what I do. Um, and I was thinking, is there a type of animal that reproduces by basically having sex with itself in the head? And the answer to that question is yes. Um, and in fact, there are many of them. And then my mind kind of wandered and I thought, um, what if you just knew all sorts of crazy, insane animal facts, and you didn't know why. You just, you just, there was no source for them. And that was sort of how my main character was born. Um, the story begins with uh, the main character, Ben, who is a regular person, but uh, aside from the fact that he has all this insane animal knowledge that sort of focuses around bug sex, oddly enough, but there's no explanation for it. Um, and he also knows about antique watches and he also knows about something called the chime, but he doesn't know what the chime is. And long story short, there are people out there who do know what the chime is and they really want it. <laughs> <laughs> well, you said earlier that you didn't know where the novel was going to go. Is that kind of indicative of how you tend to write a novel? Yeah, I'm very much a pantser. And it has been good for, for my writing. I, I'm able to write um, manuscripts relatively quickly, usually in a few months. But it's also uh, a highly risky activity. Um, with The Phlebotomist and Stringers, they came out pretty easily. And after one or two revisions, we're very close to where they needed to be. Um, I'm currently working on a, my first fantasy, and I have just finished uh, the third complete rewrite of that story. Um, the, the reason being that I had a conceit uh, two years ago that I really liked, a premise I really liked, and so I just set off to write it, and I wrote 350 pages, and as soon as I was done, I realized it did not work, so I did it again. It was a little better, but it still didn't work. <laughs> And then I did it a third time. And you're talking to someone who, when I was in law school, I had to take a class where you had to write a 30-page paper and wanted to appeal to The Hague because no one should have to write 30 pages. And now I've just written about, oh, probably a thousand pages to get one 450-page story. So I I've changed a lot since then. <laughs> And so is the third time a charm on that fantasy novel? I think it is. Yeah. So I just finished it. I'm actually going back through and revising now. I'm, I'm very excited about it. It's very ambitious. Um, Stringers was very ambitious and took some, took some layering to get it right. I'm really, really, really happy with um, how it came out because it has some really strong reveals and penny drop moments, which I really love both, both sort of the what's going on reveals as well as some really good emotional hits. Um, and this new one is similarly ambitious. Um, and I think that this first round of revisions should, should really tie it together. The, my manuscripts tend to, um, make their biggest leaps 
between the, the, the first draft and the first revision. Well, without giving away any spoilers, can you kind of, um, uh, pinpoint what wasn't working in those first two versions of the novel that you're referencing? Yeah. So, so I can, it is, I could tell you kind of how, what I think the elevator pitch for the book is, and then I can tell you how that elevator pitch actually ended up forcing me to write it correctly. So my daughter, when um, she was like four or five, she asked me why churches have steeples and I didn't know the answer. So I, I told her an elaborate story and I said, well, I think they have steeples because they need to attract an angel. And um, the bigger and better the steeple, the more powerful the angel and the more the more money that the church will be able to bring in from its congregation. <laughs> now, she knows I was full of baloney there. Um, I still don't know why churches have steeples, but that's the reason that I gave. And so I kind of sat on that idea for a while and I thought, what if angel, there were actually angels, but but not not from a religious perspective, just a purely uh, extra dimensional species that happens to be able to cross over to our world and harvest the energy of belief. Okay. And that's so, so that, that was sort of the genesis for it. I was like, okay, what if we have, we have a whole other world and these angels can cross over and, and they hang out in places where people say prayers and believe things and all of that. And they harvest it and they eat it. And I t wanted to tell that story of the, the angel world. And that's the one I wrote two times, but it was missing something. I was like, there's got, there's got to be an effect on the other side, on the earth side of this deal. And I was like, what story can I think of where there was another dimension or another world, but it also touched on the human world but where most of the time for the story was spent in the second world. And the one that came to mind was Monsters, Inc. And in fact, Monsters, Inc. is a very good comparison for this story, even though this is not a children's story. This is a very dark fantasy. But Monsters, Inc., you had monsters collecting screams. And the way they sort of told the story of the other side of the equation was not to spend a lot of time on Earth, but to have an earthling, a little girl, come across. Mm -hmm. And I needed to tell the story of how this harvesting that these angels were doing um, would affect the other side. I, I strongly believe in cause and effect. I think the best stories have to explain that. And so I thought, well, I need to have someone to come over. And the way I did that was very... In Chris fashion, it's very hyperbolic and it's very um, dramatic, and uh, it it absolutely got the book where it needed to be. So I'm telling the story of these creatures who, um, you know, are basically angels. I mean, they have wings and halos, but they serve halos don't serve the purpose that you know you you might traditionally believe they serve. They're completely different than, you know, any conception of angels you see in religion. And it's actually not a religious story really at all. Um, but that really helped me break through to, to, to look at, I always go to Pixar for inspiration or whoever did Monsters, Inc. Because those cartoons, they're very good with their plotting. They don't, there's no waste. They use everything. And um, so just, just sort of thinking about Monsters, Inc. actually really helped me get this third rewrite um, to where it needed to be. That's great. Well, what was your initial writing journey that led you to writing and getting your first novel published? That's a great question. And, um, I, you know, I'm a little different than most of, most of the writers I know and the, and the ones I listen to on, on podcasts. Um, most writers I hear talk about how, you know, they've been writing since they were little you know, and, and reading voraciously since they were little, I didn't have that path. Um, for me, it came much later. Um, I, I've always done art. I've always been creative, but I never was a big writer or a big reader. Um, 
for me, all of that came later. I, I was a very big reader of nonfiction. I read tons of nonfiction, but only around the time that my daughter was born about eight years ago, um, did I, did it open up for me, which is very strange, just sort of out of the blue. Um, we decided we were going to name her Lyra and my wife was like, do you know what that's from? And I was like, of course, no. (laughs) Um, and she, she's like, here's the book, read the book. This is where that name is from. Cause I loved the name. And so I read the dark materials trilogy and I was like, what is this called? This is, this is amazing. What is this? This is fiction. (laughs) And, um, and just begin backfilling my whole life that I'd missed with fantasy, science fiction, all of that. And then um, in, in 2015, I just, I went and saw the movie Interstellar. And I was like, I want to write movies about space. I want to write movies, uh, books mm-hmm. about space. I came home and I said, I'm going to write a book. I had to Google. And I hope this is, th- hopefully this will um, be of some help to people who are coming to it late like I did. I had to Google how to write dialogue. Like, where does the comma go? Does it go inside (laughs) the quotation or outside? That's literally how basic my, where I was. And I wrote a hundred thousand word, quote unquote, middle grade book, which is not the correct length for a middle (laughs) grade story. I queried it to, you know, 80 plus agents. Um, got a few nibbles and some very nice rejections, but nothing came of it. It was not ready, you know, and I, I kind of knew that, but I, I wrote the best story I could write at the time. Um, I put it down. I, I wrote, I started another story. Um, I lost steam around a hundred pages and then came up with the idea for the phlebotomist. I wrote the phlebotomist in about two months. I revised it over about 10 more months, queried it widely, got some nibbles, um, but eventually I, I shelved it. And then I saw Angry Robot, my publisher, once a year, they accept submissions from unagented writers. And in fact, they just did that last week. So a bunch of my friends actually um, submitted to that. And they get, you know, some years they get hundreds and hundreds of submissions and some years over a thousand. And, um, I sent I, I sent them the query and the synopsis, and they requested the f- the full manuscript. And three months later, in my junk email, was an offer from them to publish the phlebotomist. So that <laughs> check your junk email, exactly. people, because <laughs> <laughs> because I mean I think it was because it was flagged because it had the word offer, right. you know, offer, and so it was stuck in there. And I very carefully moved it to the inbox, <laughs> and um. And the rest is history. So, um, uh, you know, the phlebotomist was a very, it was very heavy on plot. It, it had a, a good premise and a good plot. Um, and I'm so thankful that um, my editor, the acquiring editor there at Angry Robot, Gemma Creffield, she liked the story and she gave me a structural edit. And you always hear of the story that, you know, I had to cut so much, you know, to get it down. Well, she, she actually said, no, you need to add about a hundred pages to this. <laughs> and I added, I did that and I, I'm very coachable. And as it was my first time, I did everything she said and she guided it beautifully in and I learned so much. And so since then I've taken all those lessons forward in the, in the subsequent things I've written. And, um, they asked for, a another pitch a few weeks after the phlebotomist came out and that ended up being stringers. And so I'm curious, are you still painting and drawing? I am, yeah. Um, I, I've been doing primarily album covers for indie bands, metal bands, stuff like that. I've been doing that since about 2011. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, some books I've done. I did the, the cover for uh, Indra Das's The Devourers. Um, which came out from, I think it was Del Rey. It's uh, Penguin Random House, but I think it was the Del Rey imprint. Right. And um, I've got another one that's coming out soon that I'm not allowed to talk about, but it's it's same same publisher. And um, and then Angry Robot let me do the illustration on the cover of the Phlebotomist, which is a 
um, sort of an anatomical heart with some flowers uh, in sort of a medical illustration style. Um, so I've done I've done fewer books than albums, but um, yeah. And then I've got some. Um, I'm doing a a label for a gin company, <laughs> so I'm doing a a bottle of gin, and I'm um, also and then I've got one more album in the hopper. So pretty much any time I've got one or two art projects going in, in addition to the writing. Yep. Well, you have an interesting TikTok genre of videos where you <laughs> read books while you're riding a bike. What inspired you to do that? <laughs> and, and are you planning on being in the next Jackass movie? <laughs> I, I am my own Jackass movie. I mean, um, so I, my, my, my sense of humor is basically I would, I would put it somewhere on the spectrum of, of aware idiot, you know, like I know, I know what I'm doing is super stupid and that makes me kind of want to do it more. Um, so yeah, so books on a bike, I've got, I don't know, I've probably got 12 videos or something every few weeks I will, um, hop on my mountain bike and just ride around the block with a hardcover uh, or with a, with a physical book. And I will read from it as I'm riding a bike, which no one should do. That's <laughs> totally stupid. Um, I do wear a helmet. Um, not that that would help me with any head on collisions. Um, but for, for your listeners out there, it's a, it's a fairly not busy area and I do, um, pay attention as best I can, but I thought it would just be funny. I mean, you can't even hardly hear what I'm saying because of the <laughs> wind and, and my camera's always falling over. Um, but I do like to shout about um, books I like, and I thought it would be a unique way to do it instead of just, um, you know, I think the, I think the book talker in, in bookstagram or blogosphere is already quite full. There's <laughs> many, many capable people who, who know how to do an actual good review and a good job. So I figured I would just read a paragraph or two while I'm riding a bike and just get some laughs, you know. That's great. Well, on that note, what novels have you read recently on a bike or off a bike that you enjoyed? <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. So um, I do a lot of reading of my friends' books before they come out. Um, so I'll give a shout. I just read uh, a manuscript by Carolyn Hardiker whose book Composite Creatures came out last year from Angry Robot. Um, this book, she's tentatively titled it Moth Town. I, I hope it eventually comes out. It's amazing. It's actually got a little bit of his Dark Materials feel to it. Um, so that's not a book anybody can buy, but for books people can buy. I'm looking at my um, bookshelf here. So uh, I have just finished City of Saints and Mad Men, um, the part of the Ambergris trilogy by Jeff Vandermeer, which just blew my socks off. I finished the second bell by Gabriella Houston. Um, Crown chasers by Rebecca Coffin Daffer, um, which is sort of a, that's sort of a space opera. I think it's, I think it's technically young adult, although I, I very much enjoyed it. Um, I did, of course, read uh, the only good Indians by Stephen Graham Jones. I think everyone has read that. And what's the other one that I'm plowing through? Um, let me see. Oh, um, Nine Fox Gambit by Yoon Ha Lee, who I think you actually interviewed, um, which was, that was a really good interview. Thank you. Yeah. Well, well, what writing advice would you offer for those who are working on their own stories and novels? You know, um, I recently looked at um, some queries that some of my friends were preparing um to send to angry robot for their submissions and then some other queries for some other friends who are just querying more widely mm -hmm. and and i think that the most practical advice i could give for people who have a finished manuscript uh, that they want to query and try to get agents is is you can do yourself so much good by, you know, spending a little time on websites like Query Shark. Um, and uh, the person who runs that site, uh, Janet Reed, she's an agent. She also has a blog, which is I think janetreed.blogspot.com. Um, 
I, when I was learning the business and learning what it was going to take as I was learning to write and frankly, to read, um, I knew it would be a long journey. I accepted that. And every day I would read a, a, a blog post, um, from Janet Reed or, or somebody else, um, sometimes on pub crawl or, or a site like that. And just sort of infuse the, the little bits of knowledge into my own sort of daily routine. And that did a lot of things for me. On the one hand, it gave me a very realistic appreciation for how difficult it was going to be to, um, to get an agent, even once I had a, a manuscript written. And like I said, I mean, I, I had queried two books to, you know, a resounding 150 plus rejections before, before, um, one editor, you know, at angry robot read my book and liked it enough to make an offer on it. Um, so reading all that, doing all of that reading, um, from people in the industry gave me a very realistic picture of what, it, what it looked like. I didn't have, you know, I, I wasn't glossy eyed and, um, thinking that boy, you know, whatever I write first is going to be the best thing out there and that I'm going to get a, a big deal and I'm going to be the next whoever, you know, I, so that, and, and, and I knew I had to do that because I do tend to think very hyperbolically and I do <laughs> tend to think that, that, you know, whatever, whatever I do is gonna, just going to be huge. And, and I, I knew I had to kind of push back on that. And so the best thing I did for my own psyche was to just say, look, this is going to be a long journey. It's going to be difficult. And frankly, once you're published, it still doesn't end. Um, you're still trying to get that second book and that third book and actually have a career. Um, and so to really just enjoy the process, and I've heard so many of the writers you've interviewed give such good advice about just keep going and just write every day. But but I would say that at the end of the day, it's it's really about did you enjoy creating what you were creating? And if you do enjoy that and you you keep working at it um, and you write when you can write, enjoy that, you will get better at it and you will continue to push the boundaries of your own ability, your craft and the things you conceive of. And eventually you will have that chance. You will get published. Um, I truly strongly believe that. I mean, you're talking to someone who had to Google how to do dialogue, you know, seven years ago. Yeah. So I really believe that. And I think though, as, as anxious as we can be and as desperate, and I was desperate very early on, um, I had to stop, take a breath and say, Hey, do you enjoy writing? And the answer was yes. So I enjoy the process and I remind myself constantly to do that. That's great. When you were going through those 150 rejections, were you ever tempted to go the indie publishing or self-publishing route? Absolutely. I, I absolutely was. And, um, you know, I do think that that can be an answer for some people. I do also think there's a, there's a, I, I would, I would continue to write and have unpublished manuscript after unpublished manuscript to try to keep being traditionally published because it gives you visibility and distribution and all of these things that you just don't automatically get if you're self-publishing. And I have friends who self-publish and it is, it is an absolute grind. Some of them do what very well at it. Um, so there are huge success stories sure. in self-publishing, but there's also another, there's also another level of refinement that traditional publishing gives you, which is I did hire when I was writing these manuscripts, I did hire and pay, um, freelance editors to look at them and help me. And they were certainly helpful, but when you have a, uh, editor at the publishing company, who actually has skin in the game, right? There's just a different level of depth uh, and commitment to the edit that you get from that that you just might not get from a freelancer who's doing a good job. But it's just a totally different game. It's a totally different perspective and motivation. Um, so, so 
you know, I certainly think that having had an editor, a freelance editor, look at the phlebotomist and help me clean it up certainly helped me actually get the deal I ultimately had. Um, but as far as the work goes, I think that it's it's just another layer of polish that ends up on it if it's traditionally published. That's no you know great revelation. But as far as the work goes, I definitely think it can up the quality. Um, and yeah, I mean, I have I have some friends who have published self published, and it's just it's a hustle, you know, an absolute hustle to get just a few hand a handful of reviews. Sure. Sure. You know, so if look, I came to this late, so I definitely thought about um, self publishing. I wanted to get out there, um, and I am not a patient person. So, uh, so the fact that I was able to be patient because I wanted a traditional publishing um, gig, if I can be patient, then anybody can be patient. <laughs> Hey, this is Jeff from the Reading and Writing Podcast. Do you know what I love when I'm reading a great new book? A cup of tea. It's such a fun ritual. Settling down with a cup of tea and a new novel that I'm excited to read. Why not treat yourself to a cup of plum deluxe teas? Every loose leaf tea is hand blended, fresh, using only the best ingredients. From bold black teas to relaxing herbal blends, incredible dessert teas, or fun floral flavors, there's a delicious tea waiting for you. And I'm not making this up. They have a flavor of tea called Reading Nook Blend Black Tea. It's a tea that pairs perfectly with reading, writing, and relaxing. Plum Deluxe is a family-owned business, and they have one of the best selections of delicious, flavorful herbal teas, as well as bold black tea flavors. Visit PlumDeluxe.com slash listen and use the promo code RWP to save 12% on your first order. Tea also makes a great gift. That's PlumDeluxe.com slash listen. And use the promo code RWP. There's nothing better than enjoying a great cup of tea with a good book. And now you can get your great tea from PlumDeluxe.com. Hey, this is Jeff, host of the podcast. You know, sometimes it seems like there's just an infinite amount of information out there. And that's exactly why I love Wondrium. Wondrium is a streaming platform that offers thousands of programs and documentaries from respected experts who really know their stuff. And for the listeners of this podcast, Wondrium has a wide selection of writing resources, how to write best-selling fiction, how to publish your book, writing creative nonfiction, every day is a poem, how to create comics, and much, much more. And the best part, you can watch or listen anytime, anywhere with the Wondrium app. Download and watch or listen on the go. Explore all of your wonders with Wondrium, and your brain will love it. That's W-O-N-D-R-I-U-M dot com slash B-O-O-K-S. Again, sign up today at wondrium.com slash books to get unlimited access with a 14-day free trial. Give it a try. That's great. Well, where can people find you online if they'd like to learn more about you and your novels? Okay. Um, my website is chrispanatier.com and it's got links to a bunch of stuff. Um, and uh, I'll I'm on Instagram at Chris Panettiere, uh, Twitter at Chris J Panettiere, and of course, TikTok, where you can see <laughs> me do books on a bike and not do as I do. Um, I think that's at Chris Panettiere right. too. Um, so yeah, that's that's pretty much everywhere I am. That's great. Well, again, we've been speaking with Chris Panettiere, author of the new novel Stringers. The novel is available now, so go buy a copy. And Chris, thanks for doing this interview. 
Thanks so much, Jeff. I, it was a pleasure to be here. Great. Thanks a lot. Here lies Ben Sullivan. Died in space. Couldn't open the pickles. Chapter 1 Jim's in the store again. Jim doesn't buy shit. Morning, Ben, said Jim. I'd always liked Jim, but he'd never so much as flirted with a spool of 5X tippet. You going out today? I asked, flipping the magnifier up from the brim of my cap. Yep, he answered, fingering some light wire hooks on a rack. You know those are for sale, right? You can buy them with money, and they become yours forever. Jim didn't respond, ambling instead to another rack of fly fishing goods he also wouldn't end up purchasing. I knocked the magnifier back down and returned to wrapping a yellow midge. Hey, said Jim, just as I'd regained my focus. What do you call that fly you made for Winston Hollymead? He won't shut up about it. He's throwing all these numbers at me that sound ludicrous. A 25-pound post-spawn striper? In the Pawnee? He blew a raspberry. Makes no sense. I chuckled pretentiously at Jim's underestimation of my work. It made a lot of sense if you knew how to get unhorny fish to bite like I did. The Alpha Boom Train isn't just for striper, I said with a shrug. It'll work on any post-spawn persiform. They like bloodworms. I don't get you, kid. I'm 29. Alpha Boom Train? Flies ain't supposed to have names like that. Customers are supposed to buy things. What a paradox. He directed a finger lazily in the direction of my fly tying vice. Need you to make me one of them boom trains then, he said, issuing an edict as if I were his personal river Sherpa. Sure thing, Jim, I answered. Will you be paying for it, or just putting it on layaway until the rapture? I'll pay if it looks right he said, heading out. He pushed the door open, then stopped, half in, half out, sending the electronic chime into a recursive death spiral. How you know so much about spawning river fish anyway? You ever even been out of Kansas? Now I could tell him the truth. I could explain the things I know, that my knowledge goes way beyond fish sex. I could tell him, for instance, that the flatworm Macrostomum hystrix reproduces by fucking itself in the head. It's called hermaphroditic traumatic insemination. I could tell him that the practice isn't isolated solely to hermaphrodite worms either. Sea slugs. Cypheterin, species one. Oh, here we go. Doing the scientific names showing off thing. Also hermaphrodites. Fuck each other in the head. They do it with a two-pronged dong, one of which is called the penile stylet. I could shock his system with the revelation that earwigs have two dicks. There's a trick dick in the event of a broken penis. Or take him on a tour of class mammalia and into the dens of prairie voles, who are affectionate and monogamous with each other unless the male is drunk, in which case he pursues anonymous hookups. That dolphins will fuck literally anything. That porcupines flirt via golden shower. I could tell him these things I know, but then I might have to explain why I know them. And that I am unable to do. So I answered his question with the simple truth. I just know, Jim. That internet, then, he said, answering the question for himself. See you in a few days, kid. I flipped down the magnifier. Jim? The truth is, I was jealous of Jim, of his obliviousness, his ability to step into the world from the shop and move on with his life, while mine never changed. Wherever I went... My brain came with, bringing along its innumerable tidbits of faunal knowledge which infected my every thought. There was no explanation and no apparent source, and it would have been completely useless if I didn't work in a fishing shop trying to figure out new ways to get post-coitus fish to bite at fake bug larvae. I'm no fly fishing fanatic. I'm just too distractible for any other job. Every waking moment is a constant barrage of intrusive thoughts, with even the most innocuous stimuli churning up commentary from deep within the folds of my brain. Koalas and koala-like animals have smooth brains, a condition known as lysencephaly. Kill me. See? 
I've tried training myself to think of it as background noise, but it's tough to tune out when your overactive brain is also an asshole. I'm just a distilled version of you, buddy. Besides, assholes can be really useful. The giant California sea cucumber, Apastacopus californicus, eats and breathes through its butt. The door chimed again, as if it were being strangled. Through the magnifier came a giant yellow blob that I immediately recognized as Patton, my never-employed stoner friend. He wasn't a stoner by choice. Well, it was by choice, but it wasn't just for getting high. Weed legitimately helped him function. Patton was the only person I'd ever met who got paranoid as a consequence of not being high. Also, weed is generally pollinated by wind, not by bees. He struck a pose and pointed at me, suggesting a pop quiz. In which order will we find D. Sylvestris? I'm not doing this, dude. Hymenoptera, he said, proudly answering his own question. How long did you have to train your eight neurons to remember that? A while, he said breezily, removing a blunt from within his hair somewhere. You can't smoke that in here. I know that. He sniffed it and returned it to its hay bale. In one of his many attempts to push me to broaden my horizons, Patton had tried to get me to audition for Jeopardy, R.I.P. Alex Trebek, convinced I'd make a bazillion dollars. What he failed to appreciate was that the only way for me to win would be if every single category was natural science. I don't know jack about much else. Okay, I also know a lot about clocks. Mainly watches. Ugh, this is so embarrassing. If areas of knowledge were like college specializations, then entomology, with a focus on bug sex, would have been my major, with a minor in timepieces. Horologics. Antiques, for the most part. Anything older than about three decades. Imagine seeing a watch and having your head suddenly flooded with facts about said watch, while at the same time not giving two shits about the watch or the facts. A $6,000 Rolex that gains five seconds per day is said to be within tolerances. That's over $1,000 for every second it steals from the universe. The NASA astronauts who landed on the moon were wearing Omega Speedmasters, all except Neil Armstrong, who left his inside the lunar lander as a backup clock. Watches on display are almost always set at 10 past 10 or 10 till 2 because the hands form a smiley face, a subtle form of suggestion for the prospective buyer. Do I come from a family of watchmakers or antique dealers? Nope. I just know. And it's exhausting. Well, if you won't do it, then at least train me, man, said Patton. Be like my game show sensei. Just put all your knowledge up here. He popped the side of his head with his palm. Plenty of room. I know, right? So there's no excuse. Please, dude. Winning game shows is the only way for me to get enough cash to start my own Formula One racing team. No. Win you off. Seven. Want to get wings? He asked. No, busy. Not research again. Come on, dude, every night? You know the drill, I said. It's Friday, though. Friday. I gave him serious guy face. All right, he relented. Roll over to my place in the morning. Aunt Lisa will make us chorizo empanadas and refried beans, and we can play Simon. The original Simon was first marketed by Milton Bradley in 1978 and later on by Hasbro. The console has four colors, red, blue, yellow, and green, running clockwise from the upper right. The colors light up with a corresponding sound in a random sequence, and each player's challenge is to repeat the combination exactly. Your Aunt Lisa microwaving frozen breakfast empanadas is not making breakfast. And I'll pass on the beans. But Simon is awesome. I'll be there. Yeah! He reached around the counter and patted the underside of that bit of my belly that hangs over my belt buckle. I fired a palm into his sternum, and he crashed satisfyingly into a rack of indicators. Dude! He wheezed, accepting my justice. No more fat slapping. Jesus Christ, man, grow up. 
He staggered away from the rack and smiled passively at the door. Okay, bro. Whatever you say. Hasta mañana. Spanish. Wow, really? Bye. See you tomorrow. Empanadas. Yeah, bye. I needed to get to the library, but I also wanted to finish off a fly I'd been tying, a Hutch's Pennell, for one of the area's best anglers and possible future wife of me, Agatha Jensen. It's used in the UK for catching coastal sea trout, but it also closely resembles the sedge flies that the local bluegills, Lapomis macrochirus, love to eat. When I started tying them a year ago, the locals couldn't get enough, and it kept the shop owner, also named Jim, I call him Owner Jim, pretty happy. I could do them in my sleep. Size 4 hook, black 8-0 thread, a red tippet, peacock hurl, zebra hackle, and silver wire for the rib. Fly fishermen were always looking for an angle. Anglers, right? And this panel had them shelving their silver sedges, the traditional go-to when throwing loops for fish that go for the caddis fly. I tied in a white hackle feather, wrapped it with thread, thickened the front of the hook to form the fly's head, and tapped a bead of glue at the top of the shank just under the eye. After locking up the shop, I had 30 minutes until the library closed, which was fine, because I already knew the book I'd reserved was waiting for me. I jumped into the used Subaru that I'd bought after graduating high school. At the time, I'd let Patton talk me into souping it up so we could race it on weekends, in actuality, that always seemed to get sidelined by our full schedule of being stoned. Now, I just had a car that sounded like a weed eater in a porta potty. But it was fast, and I got to the library in 16 minutes, per my $25 Timex brand digital wristwatch, which does not gain 5 seconds per day, unlike a certain unnamed luxury brand performing within tolerances. It's Rolex. I know. Ben. Ludlow the Librarian, I said, miming the solo sword dance of Conan the Barbarian, as played by Arnold Schwarzenegger. Ludlow was similar to a barbarian, if you replaced the muscles with nougat and the leather armor with black nail polish. I got your book right here, reserved for Ben, he said, tapping a lacquered finger on a sticky note reading the same. Oh, great, thanks, I said rolling up to the circulation desk. Ludlow prepared to scan in the book, pausing first to consider the cover. He pulled his long, warlock black hair behind an ear. I could see a question forming. Oh, here it comes. You studying to become a psychiatrist, Ben? Uh, no, Ludlow. I didn't have much more of an answer for him that I cared to give, though he was well aware of my borrowing history. Just a hobby, then? Remote viewing? Clear cognizance? Not so different from your weekly seances, I quipped. You get up in all your customers' business? Only if I think they might be performing witchcraft. Afraid you won't be invited? I'm talking about... He lowered his voice. The occult. I stared at him incredulously. Have you seen yourself, man? He recoiled with offense. I'm a goth, Ben, not a Wiccan. He slid the book across the counter with a corpse pale hand. I'll remember that for next time, I said, taking the book and tapping the side of my head. The car rumbled into the gravel drive at the house where I rented an above garage apartment. I opened the driver's door to a thundering chorus of Neo Tibetan Linnae, known to laypersons. As cicadas, booming away like nature's own heavy metal string symphony. Although that's a bad analogy, because while crickets utilize stridulation for their song, the rubbing of one body part against another, a crude version of pulling a bow across strings, cicadas are percussionists, vibrating a membrane in their exoskeleton called a timbal. Yeah, so anyway, it was noisy outside. I tossed the new book. Harnessing Your Psychic Powers Part 4, Remote Viewing and Claircognizance, onto a larger pile of similarly themed texts beside my desk, and quietly hated on myself for possessing any of them. Taking in the collection, I began to appreciate the merit of Ludlow's witchcraft accusation. 
I even had a stack of religiously themed candles on a nearby end table, though those had come with the apartment. Sure, I lit them from time to time, but for ambiance, not any ceremonial purposes. On my way to the fridge, I paused at the giant Lego sculpture that had risen from the surface of the coffee table in recent months. My parents had treated my moving out as their cue to begin a steady process of getting rid of anything I'd ever owned, including a massive tub of the plastic bricks. I'd planned to give them away, but started pressing them together one day and, soon, well, I found playing Legos to be a calming and cathartic exercise. And yes, I am almost 30. What began as a mindless ad-libbing of pieces ballooned into a gargantuan living room monument that looked like one of those spiky naval mines set atop a golf tee. I reached down to the pile, grabbed a gray 8x2 and a brown 6x2, overlapped four of the studs, and pressed them together with a satisfying scritch, then added the component to the ponderous hulk. There was leftover kale and chicken hash in the fridge, which I warmed, doused in barbecue sauce, and devoured with a spatula as I snapped more Legos onto the art. I subscribed to the canceling out method of eating, where you eat as much junk as you want, so long as you cancel it out with something healthy. I figured the kale would counter tomorrow's breakfast empanadas. Holding the spatula between my teeth, I dragged my laptop over and tapped it to life. So, why was I burning through library cards checking out books on psychic phenomena? Why was I there almost every night and then on the internet for hours after that? Well, it had to do with the bug-fucking and the watches. As a child, tiny pieces of information would crystallize in my head before there was any way for me to have learned them. Deja vu was one possibility, but I've had deja vu, and it isn't quite the right fit for my experience. You never actually learn anything from deja vu. It's just the sense of vague recollection that fades almost as quickly as it comes. My experience was different. Repetitive. Verifiable. I knew things I had no business knowing. Male soapberry bugs, Jadera hematoloma, are absolute sex hounds, screwing for up to 11 days in one go just to ensure that other males don't inseminate the same female. What in the national goddamn geographic fuck, right? No one should just know that. My parents recognized early on that there was something weird happening. The second I could make words, I began referencing obscure facts, the truth of which could be verified with a little research, but for which my knowledge had no basis. At first, they just assumed I was a focused listener. Maybe I'd heard someone drop an interesting nugget in line at the grocery store. Kids repeated stuff all the time. But as I crossed out of toddlerhood, the pattern settled in. Instead of the occasional passing fact bomb, I might give a play-by-play -play of the mating habits of Brazilian bark lice, leaving out no detail. In between bites of mac and cheese, I'd let slip that the female actually has a dick that she uses to scoop sperm from the male bark lice's vagina. I remember my parents being in such awe of science that they'd not cared that I was blabbing about insect uglies at the dinner table. So off I went to the pediatrician for the basic is this kid okay? No. Check up. And on from there to the child psychologist. My parents explained to her that I was some sort of genius, but a few simple tests quickly dispelled that hypothesis. Unperturbed, they insisted on a full battery of IQ tests, which were conclusive. I was solidly average, entirely unremarkable. I was simply regurgitating information and terminology of unknown provenance, they went for a second opinion. My scores went down. I was a parrot, not a prodigy. Still, they wanted answers. So did I. A barnacle of kale and chicken plunked on the laptop's touchpad. I set the spatula down next to it and eased it back on board with my pinky, then hoovered it up. Together, my parents explored every contrived and far-flung theory to explain my curious condition— going so far as to accuse me of reading books in secret. Sneaking off to read? I mean, do people do that? Certainly not me. I had video games to play and snacks to eat. 
which I then later canceled out with different snacks. There was a phase, thankfully brief, where my parents became quite manic in trying to answer the ultimate question. The house was filled with books on gifted children, from verifiable prodigies like Bobby Fischer, youngest ever U.S. chess champion at age 14, Blaise Pascal, French inventor and mathematician, authored a treatise on projective geometry at age 16, and Maria Agnesi, wrote solutions to complex math problems in her sleep. To the entirely paranormal, ghost possession by historical figures unwilling to cross the river Styx. They got into psychophony. Spirit speaks through a medium, me in this case. Retrocognition. Knowledge of a past event which was not learned or inferred. Transference. How doctors say possession. Claircognizance like omniscience, except with more incense. And, of course, remote viewing. Knowledge of something one cannot directly perceive, also known as ESP, or extrasensory perception. Or the scientific term, bullshit. For an entire year, every horizontal surface of our downstairs was covered in crystals. The local news even did a story once. There I was, blithely regaling the weatherman with a credible and detailed description of Grasshopper's sex gear as he grinned nervously into the camera. The whirlwind of brief regional fame disappeared as quickly as it had arrived, and by fourth grade, I was a local oddity that most people noted and then promptly forgot. The novelty wore off. One minute, you're blowing your teacher's minds, and the next they're sending you to the principal's office for offering to explain how liver flukes spread via sheep shit. It wasn't like I could help it. Holding in what my brain was spewing was a form of torture. My mind was a kettle under pressure, and my mouth the spout. Ultimately, my parents kept their sanity, resolving to accept the way I was. It wasn't like I had a disease or anything, just an interesting glitch in my wiring. A mutation, maybe. It was a party trick, like being double-jointed or popping out an eyeball. They moved on. I couldn't. You can ignore another person if you want. Put on headphones, tell them to buzz off if they won't take the hint. Brains are different. We never take the hint. You're a captive audience to an unfiltered version of yourself. The me that occupies my cranium is a know-it-all jabberer. I'm trapped with someone who won't shut up. Like that guy in line at the coffee shop who wants to discuss his passion for latte foam art. Now, imagine he's in your head. But instead of heart doodles and bubbled milk, it's precision timepieces in the toothed vagina of the cabbage white butterfly. Just imagined it. Sleep is my only respite. And even then, the thoughts creep in. I lit some of the candles illuminating four different versions of white Jesus, then hopped on the internet to begin the evening search, as I did every night. Knowing what I know has never been a gift, and I was singularly driven by an obsession to find the cause. My life was a mad search for answers that occupied my time and attention, to the exclusion of nearly everything else. If a patient wakes up from surgery with a bit of gauze sewn into their arm, it sucks, but at least they know how it got there. My condition had no explanation. It was too specific to be the result of chance or coincidence. It felt purposeful or planted, like it was inserted into my head. It wasn't mine. And if the knowledge wasn't mine, was I even myself? Was I an experiment, someone's project or toy? And to what end? I didn't know. That is why I searched so vigilantly. Like I said, it isn't a gift. It's an invasion. By now, you know that sound. It's the sound of the Home Depot. But what about those sounds? Those are the sounds of a new laundry set that provides a powerful yet gentle clean in less time, making this 
the sound of savings on top brand appliances. The Home Depot. How doers get more done. Get up to 25% off plus 750 instant savings on select appliances. Valid June 22nd through July 13th. U.S. only. Gas dryer extra. See store for details. This week on RVER. Sponsored by Progressive Insurance. Oh, that new doctor is dropped at gorgeous. <sighs> Please, he's just another RV League educated surgeon with good hair. No, he's different. Nurses, we got a classy motorhome with a detached driver's side mirror. Meet me in the OR. Stat. Right away, doctor. No, 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 she's on break. I'll handle this one. Oh, you conniving little... When your RV really needs saving, Progressive has you covered. See if you could save with a leader in RV insurance. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and affiliates covered subject to policy terms.